You saw him. He made a brief cameo at the beginning of that Sage Northcutt interview, but now we are officially being joined by the UFC welterweight champion, Tyron Woodley. There he is. Tyron, how are you? I'm doing great. How are you guys doing? Uh, doing great. Always a pleasure to talk to you. We have a lot to talk about, but first let me ask you this. What is it like, truthfully? You spend so much time with Sage now, and people are fascinated by him. What's it like? What's it like just hanging out one-on-one -on -one with him? Man, you know, you don't believe it until you're around him. You know, someone can eat that clean, someone can train that way, and, you know, everything he does is purely systematic you know he's a great kid and some people think it's fluff and he's just doing it for the cameras man he's like that every day all day he calls me mr woodley <laughs> and um you know part of me want to be like man don't call me mr woodley anymore but you know i think our sport has lost the respect he's lost the honor and um i don't want to take that away from him so if you want to um carry on with some of the traditional respect that the martial art brings uh, i'm not going to be the person to tell him not to you know he had my sons in the living room doing <laughs> hundreds of push-ups and hundreds of sit-ups and burpees and 300 second planks and now they're all like hey you know i want to eat a metabolic meal for breakfast and wow you know we need to do workouts as a family so i mean he he might have got adopted his big brother today uh -huh. <laughs> hey look in this day and age we can use good role models and there's nothing bad you can yeah. say about the kid so um let him keep doing his thing you know, he's been a good role like surprise i mean i don't think he realized but um there's a lot of ways about myself that you know I feel like I need to get back in alignment. You know, I feel like, you know, just being in the game, being around so much stuff and, um, you know, having to go through so much, I feel like some of my ways I've kind of been um, kind of slipped in, you know, and he gives you that, especially spiritually, you know, I feel like I've kind of slipped spiritually in certain areas of my life and just being around him and you feel bad swearing, you feel bad, you know, um, doing things you shouldn't do. So he's almost been uh, a bit of a role model to me to get myself back on track. Wow, that is great to hear. Um, okay, let's talk about you. Uh, no secret, it has been an interesting, you know, few days for you um, ever since that no. media tour started with the ESPN interview and then a few others afterwards. Let's start with this. Do you regret anything that you've said over the past few days? You know, it's funny. And, and before we even start, because I know we're going to get into this, I want to just make sure everybody know that one, Wonder Boy has never said anything or done anything racist towards me. I do not think Wonder Boy is racist himself. And also make sure you check us out, Fight March 4th, yes. um, 2017, to the UFC 209. We'll be getting down in um, Las Vegas, um, buy it on pay-per-view. So I want to make that clear. And I, I looked at the video before you called me because I wanted to make sure. This is a sensitive subject. A lot of people aren't going to like it. I can explain so I'm blue in the face. Some people still would never agree with me. They would still think that, you know, I'm playing a victim. But I had to watch. And just a facial expression that Wonder Boy was having when we were doing the interview, he was looking a bit puzzled. He was looking like, I don't know where he get, he's getting that from. So I'm not saying that he, he won't understand it. He won't get it because it's not him. Yeah, I'm not saying it is him. And and a part of the problem is um, individuals. You know, Sage is a perfect example as well. You know, we picked Sage up from the airport on Martin Luther King Day. We went down Skid Row and we we looked at you know just you know how blessed we are and, and that man everything is not that bad. You know, we we think things are so bad for us and I'm like this is bad, man. And we really was counting our blessings. And you know, we went to watch. Birth of a nation together. I know it sounds crazy, but he walked out of there mad because he didn't realize those things happened. Hmm. He was like, why did they do that? I'm mad. So I feel like Wonder Boy is in that same category. He himself, his family, and probably the people he surrounds himself has probably never participated in racism, never treated someone differently because of their, their gender, their race, or, or their background. But that does not mean it does not exist. Hmm. And I think what we have is we have individuals who have not participated and individuals who have not done it themselves. So since they have not, they feel like it's not happening. Oh, my God, race slavery was so long ago. Oh, it's 2017. We have a black president. Racism doesn't exist. How can it exist in this day? Oh, look at all this money that these athletes are making. So. I watched it clearly, man. I wanted to. I wanted to find something that was wrong. I wanted to find something that you know I fabricated. I threw up. But I, honestly, man, I stand by my words. Okay. I, I don't feel like anything was wrong. Anything was incorrect. Okay. So when you say that you feel like if the complexion of your skin was was different, that the fans would treat you differently, you know that that is a very eye opening statement. I mean, you have to pay attention to that. It would be ignorant not to and i said on my show on on thursday the ma beat that it would probably 
help you if you cited some examples, not only with this statement, but also when you say that you're the worst treated champion in UFC history. And I want to put that one aside. I want to get to that in a second because they're not maybe necessarily the same. Maybe they are. But are you able to give us examples as to some of the things that have happened to you, you believe negatively because of the color of your skin? You know, um, I have to think about this, and I'm going to be honest with you, Ari. This is the first time I've ever did an interview, and I took down some notes because I want to speak from the heart. I want to be real with you guys, but there are certain things that it does not make sense for me to bring up. Okay. There are things that have been obstacles in my life, but I've overcome those obstacles. And me bringing those things up will make it seem as if I'm complaining, okay. and everybody's waiting on me to be the race baiting or the race car player at the play. But if you look at the history of our sport, and it's not even our sport, the history of the American culture, mm. certain things are subliminally racist that people don't understand that are racist. When you say to me, Tyron, you are well-spoken, what does that mean? Does that mean I'm well-spoken comparable to all the mixed martial artists, the 500 UFC fighters on the roster? Or does that mean as a black male in America, you're pretty well-spoken comparable to other African-Americans? What does that really mean? People say that don't even understand what it means. When you say that I'm a freak athlete, does that mean that I don't work hard? That I'm going, I'm going to fade in the later rounds? That I don't have great cardio? That I don't have a great skill set? It, it comes off to me as a man, you're a strong person. It's almost, uh, it's almost sound barbaric like that, hey, you know, you're strong, you can knock people out, but if it gets to the later rounds, you might get tired, you might fade, and all those mus muscles come with, then, you know, uh, come at a cost. So I think that the mindset of the American public, we subliminally are insensitive that these things take place. We're insensitive to the fact that some people are discriminated on, and not black and white. You know what I mean? Uh, a buddy of mine just left uh, um, just left here a second ago. We were talking about this. Uh, a, a big sponsor and a big, you know, supporter of me. He said, in my restaurant, you come into my restaurant and people come in with their pants hanging down. And they come in, I want to use the bathroom. This is America. I can use your bathroom. He said, you know, calm down. And they immediately say, well, I'll kick your Chinese butt. And he's not even Chinese. He's Vietnamese. But hmm. he said, I have to endure that. And guess what? I do it with a smile on my face. This is what I love. I'm living the American dream. You know what I mean? This is, I didn't speak English. I was made fun of. I was picked on. I had to learn Taekwondo to learn how to fight. But now I'm living the American dream. Does he come up every single day and talk about the things that he went through in high school and people making fun of him, picking on him? No. He talks about his relationship now, his, his peers now. So it's not that it's in MMA fans. It's the American public. Mm. And those American public just so happen to want to take, um, pay attention to the most fastest growing, most important sport in America right now, which is mixed martial arts. So those fans have came on and brought those same ideology into our sport. They look at African American athlete, and not only just that, not only just the fans, the judges. You might have a judge that can be looking at me and waiting on me to fatigue, waiting on me to tire. I've listened to you know people broadcast my fights. And I completely steamrolled Carlos Conner in the first round. And the broadcaster says, let's watch the technique of Carlos Condon and the cardio of Tyron Woodley. Why would you paint that picture when I completely dominated this individual around? Why not watch the butt whooping that he just laid on my man and see if he can do it again for the second and third round? So the perception is there. And I think it's indirect most times, but sometimes it's blatant. So a lot of the fans have said to me, well, okay, Tyron is saying this, fine, but what about Anderson Silva? What about John Jones? What about Rampage Jackson? There have been black stars in MMA. Why is he different? What is your response to that? Well, it's, not, it's, it's not that I'm different. It's the fact that I'm speaking. Hmm. I was bold enough to speak on it, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I'm not going to say names, but if I can share with you guys my direct message, if I can show you the calls that I've gotten and the, the text message I've gotten from... Some of those champions we're even talking about, mm. and also Caucasian Americans and Indian Americans, all these individuals say, Tyron, it's a bold thing you're doing, but I support it. You're right, man. I have experiences, and I'm glad you said that, man, because I've been going through this for a long time, and, you know, it's just a tough spot, you know, and, and I can't really say anything. Think about the, the athlete, not even only African Americans, just the athlete in general, when you when you when you go out on something so boldly, when you already know some people are gonna oh you're playing the victim mindset, you're doing this, they're immediately gonna jump to that boat. So when you do that, 
that's scary that, hey, maybe if I take a loss, I'm going to be out of this company. Maybe I won't get the sponsorship. Maybe I won't get the opportunity. So therefore, they're fearful for saying it. And I, I can be honest, I was one of those individuals in 2016. But when Muhammad Ali died, and I started thinking about what he did, it was never convenient. It was never comfortable. It was never the right time. Same thing with any other freedom fighter, Martin Luther King. And I'm not comparing myself, because I know some people are going to take this left field. I'm not comparing myself to the great Muhammad Ali or Martin Luther King. What I'm telling you is that at that time, they did not know they were going to be Martin Luther King mm. and Muhammad Ali. They did not know they were going to be figures that did so much outside of their field to impact change. They did it because it was right. So I'm bringing... Um, I'm bringing, you know, the lights of some situations that have happened to me, that have happened to some of my peers that exist in the sport, not only in a sport, but sports in general, that we need, at least need to bring out on the table. As uncomfortable as it is, we need to discuss it and we need to talk about it. Is this something that has been bothering you for a long time, but now that you're the champion, now that you're getting more interviews, now that you're on a big stage, you feel like, okay, this is the opportunity. As uncomfortable as it may be, I need to, I would be doing a disservice to myself, to my family if I don't talk about it. Because, you know, when you were in Strike Force, it wasn't like this. You weren't being asked to speak so many times. You weren't doing interviews on ESPN, but you also weren't bringing up this stuff. Has it changed over time? Or is it only now that you have these platforms that you want to educate people about what you're going through and what maybe some other fighters are going through as well? It's not only about the um, platform. It's the fact that I have three young boys mm. and, you know, I have people that are looking up to me, people that are, that are mentored by me that will come after me. And though I didn't bring those things up in Strike Force, and granted, during that time in Strike Force, I was a rising star. I was an up and coming challenger. I really didn't. I, I had the opposite treatment. You know, what I mean, I was I was being catapulted to, you know, fighting for fighting for a title. So, you know, I, I wasn't really um, receiving that type of treatment um, when I was fighting with Scott Coker and those guys. I, I didn't I didn't really feel that, you know, I wasn't even playing field. But when I was in, in college, just because I don't bring it up, everybody assumes someone someone said on the Internet, oh, what are you complaining about? You got this cushy job behind a desk and you the world champion. And you probably get paid well. And this but you don't understand what it's what it's took for me to get here. You don't understand what I had to endure to get here. You don't understand all the things that have been thrown at me, many of which I can't even share, mm. that I've had to I've had to address, I've had to endure. Because I don't talk about it doesn't mean it didn't happen. Because I overcame it doesn't mean that it wasn't an obstacle or problem. And what I worry is that what if the person that comes after me? I got three kids. A lottery says one of my boys might end up doing professional martial arts. Do I do my sons an injustice by not stepping up and speaking out on things that I feel are incorrect and unjust in this world, in this sport, and I don't use that platform. What is our platform for? Yeah. Is it for me to make all this money and, you know, show bold and talk about how great I am? Or is it to speak to a large group of people all at once, knowing that everybody won't receive it, but the fact that some will, some people might be at home. They might be suffering through the same thing in a different work field. And if they can listen to it and they can say, man, you know what? I'm not the only one that's going through a situation like this. I can push through it. I can endure and I can make it through this. Then it's worth me doing it. It's worth me risking, you know, maybe missing out on something that, that could have happened had I not came out and, and spoke on it. I, I know even for myself firsthand, people have um, written to me saying, thank you for talking about this stuff. I am a black man living in America and I 100% understand where Tyron's coming from. I've been through the same things that Tyron is alluding to. So I can't imagine what some of the message you messages you are receiving sound like, read like. Let me ask you this. The fact that you've been talking about it on platforms like ESPN um, and other places as well, has it gotten worse? Because you know, like, people get uncomfortable with this idea of racism and, and, and talking about racism and then they, 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 they say crazy things. Or do you feel like it's getting better? Do you feel like you are getting letters of encouragement, people writing to you and letting you know that, okay, yes, I, I, I have people who are supporting me. What has it been like over the last few days? Well, it's, it's, it's been a mixed bag to okay. be honest, um, but the people that support me and know me, if those people will come to me and say, Tyron, you're tripping. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. My my my, my father-in-law called me yesterday. Okay. And he told me, he said, Tyron, they persecuted Jesus. Nobody liked him. It didn't it didn't take him off his goal. Nobody liked Barack Obama. It didn't take him off his vision and his goal. They may not like you. Who gives a F? Focus on the task at hand. You got a kid that's talented and skilled enough to take your belt from you. 
He wants to take your opportunities from you and your family. And if you let the social media and you let these topics and discussion distract you and take your mind off the task, he's going to take your belt. Mm. And it got real to me because at the end of the day, I really only have this platform because I'm champion. Mm. If I was a number one contender, if I was something different, I would not have the ability to go out and speak so boldly because I'm in a position right now where I'm the champion of the world. I'm the best welterweight on the planet Earth in the best division in the UFC or any other organization, and I can speak boldly because I'm in that position. Mm. If I was in Warner Boys' position, it might not be as received. You know what I mean? So I agree that some people won't like it, but the people that I found, and, and it's been really alarming, the fighters. You know, some of the fighters, you're a professional fighter yourself, and we wonder why... We have two separate unions trying to develop. You wonder why mm. we don't have the unity amongst fighters as is. But we're supposed to unify together, hold hands, and kumbaya. That's supposed to happen now? If I, I, I message those guys. Some, some guys I wouldn't even give their name credit to. But I message them. I say, if you had a problem with me and what I said, you can direct message me. And say, hey, man, as a, as a former athlete or as a current athlete in this roster... I have an issue with what you're saying, man. I really don't think it's race. I really don't think it's favoritism. I really don't think it's um, politics. You know, can you explain this to me? Now, I don't deserve, I mean, I don't have to explain to anybody. Sure. But at that point, they would have earned my respect. And they would have gotten a few experiences that I've had that made me come to that, you know, that, 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 um, that stance. But when you go out blamely and you do that, that literally... Um, that literally basically just makes me come out of a bag because now that's the exact purpose. When you say, Hey, Tyra, oh, I knew you and Kyle, you was a freakish athlete. No, I wasn't a damn freakish athlete. I was a hard worker. Mm. I was dedicated. I had a strong skill set. I had a strong will. I had a strong mindset. And I wouldn't take no for an answer. That's why I was a great athlete. Not because I had this extra calf muscle and I was extra strong because I was African American. That's a slap in my face. You know what I mean? I have an issue with that when people say, oh, watch Tyra in the later rounds. I'm I'm partly glad that the fight went to a draw. I'm glad we went to five rounds. I'm glad I did knock him out immediately because everyone would have said after that that Tyron Woodley probably would have faded in the later rounds. You know what I mean? So, so yeah, you know, I'm, I'm getting a mixed review, but I'm getting a lot of support. And I, I agree with you. Maybe I did need to come out today and, and speak on some of the particulars that happened so people don't think that I'm just, oh, you know, I'm race baiting and um, using a race car. And what is what what does it mean to use a race car, area? When you think about the race car, what does that mean to you? Or, or race baiting? I mean, some people feel like when you talk about these things, you're trying to play on emotions. I'm not one to. I've never used that phrase uh, to describe someone in sports or in the public eye. But you play on these emotions. You play on these hot topics to uh, elicit a response f out of the audience. So it could be, you know, a white man talking about certain things about other races. It could be a black man talking about certain things that he's gone through to, to just kind of get people riled up inside because this is a topic that makes people very emotional. That's, that's at least how I think of it. Okay, so, so race baiting could be perceived as something that you're purposely doing to try to rile people up and using race to do so. And maybe a okay? disingenuous way, thing, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, in a disingenuous way. And the second thing could be the race car could be you utilizing your race as an excuse on why you weren't a lot of certain opportunities and you were not successful. You didn't make it because someone basically held you down, right? Yep, yep. So those are two separate things, yep. but they kind of go hand in hand. So if I'm the champion of the world, how would me speaking on race be the race car? I've overcome those obstacles. Mm. I have made it to this point. Mm. I am the champion of the world. So me playing a race car would be silly. And I feel like I do enough things in my life, being a stunt guy, an actor, a, a, a analyst on Fox, you know, um, a father, a husband, a gym owner, an entrepreneur, uh, someone that gives back to the community, that mentors, trains kids. I have enough to get the conversation going that I don't need to use race to bait in more attention. You know what I mean? I, I know how to keep myself in the conversations. It's not, it's not, it's not rocket science. I, I, it's not on accident. I know how to keep myself in the mix. I don't need race to do that. So when I hear those statements, that's how it feels to me. And it really feels like that person that says that 
immediately it comes off as insensitive. Mm. Either they're, mm -hmm. you know, like I was saying with Sage and uh, Wonder Boy, they may have never experienced it. They may have never saw it in their life. Because you've never seen it. It's like me saying, hey, I've never went to war. I've never been a, a vet. But when if I see someone, you know, walking up and down Los Angeles streets, chanting his uh, army chant, I'm not going to be like, oh, man, the war was so long ago. He should have just went to the VA and got help. I don't understand what he went through. Mm. So, therefore, I can't make a stance on what he's going through currently. You know what I mean? Or how to, you know, get him out of that situation. So... And at the end of the day, you probably just want people to listen to you and have an open mind and heart. And if you're saying it, I hope that they are coming away with this, believing that you are speaking the truth and not being disingenuous. Let me ask you this. You also said that you feel like you're the worst treated champion in UFC history. Do you also think that that is because the color of your skin or for other reasons? You know, I'm going to give, I'm gonna give an example real quickly. Okay. And then it'll kind of put it into play. Okay. I had a photographer that was shooting me, um, <clears throat> shooting me for a fight. And he came to me as a friend and said, Tyron, you know, I think you need to ease up a little bit, brother. You know, you kind of you kind of going a little hard in the paint. Maybe you should back up a little bit on some of the statements. And maybe if you were a little bit softer, you would get more endorsements. You would get more exposure and it can use you more for this. You don't want to have this stance because if you do, then you're going to put a flag on yourself. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know what I said to him? I said, you know, um, I said, OK, I I'll take that into consideration. OK. I just left it there. In my mind, I knew that he only knew probably one twentieth of what I actually went through. I don't speak about it sure. because I don't allow it to stop me. Uh -huh. He came back to me after my fight in New York City, UFC 205, and he said, with tears in his eyes, he said, I apologize to you. He said, I apologize to you and all my years of covering this sport. I've never seen a champion treated this way. Huh. I've never seen a champion being placed in a position like this. I've never seen his opponent or his adversary as a contender advertised so greatly. And you almost seen this as you as a challenger. He said, I apologize to you. And now I understand. He said, more importantly, I don't even understand how you've been able to operate this long under these conditions. Wow. You know, so, so me coming out and me speaking about, you know, my treatment now, granted, they called me on the right day. The the, the reporter, um, Carrie Champion, had some. She has a way of getting getting me, um, you know, to say what I what I said. I might have woke up on the wrong side of bed, but either way, it go. I don't take it back. It got this discussion out, and the UFC is contacting me. Oh. The PR people have contacted me, okay. and they want to say, "Hey, we hear, we hear that, um, we hear that you are having this. We hear that you are having this um situation, and." We want to understand why. We want to understand how do you feel like that. We want to understand how we can do better. What do you think that we could do that we haven't been doing? What makes you think you're um, the worst treated champion in the sport? What opportunities do you feel like should have been allotted to you um, as a champion that you were not given? How can we move forward? Maybe you can give us your list of things that you have going on, your events and all these different things, and maybe we can get behind it. So the step has already been taken mm. to fix the problem. That was the reason why I'm speaking out. Not to race bait, not to get people to argue, but if it wasn't a problem and it wasn't a current situation that exists in a sport, why would my promoter be contacting me on how to solve the problem? Now hats off to them because they didn't have to do that. They could have said, okay, well you thought you thought you was the worst treated champion then, boom, we finna really make it bad for you. But they didn't do that. Mm. So hats off to them because now we're taking steps to make sure I don't feel like that and make sure no other fighter ever on the roster feels that way. So are you confident that things will change now? Do you think that you speaking up about it on the biggest of platforms will lead to change and come March 4th, you know, the build up, the fight week, there were things that clearly bothered you about the way it was positioned between you and Wonder Boy. Do you think things will change now? Are you confident that you'll see that? I mean, the, the biggest, the, everybody's, everybody's waving me down and signaling me, making sure I'm sitting up crazy. Um, I, I think the biggest thing I can do is go out there and make a bold statement. Okay. Um, we all know that if I'm not the champion, um, let me lose this fight. Everybody's like, oh, see, that's what you get, race bait that. Oh, the, the race card didn't help you win that fight. Like, if I lose this fight, everybody is going to basically move on. I'm going to be pressed down to the bottom of the topic of discussion. The best thing I can do to, to empower anybody and to inspire anybody to in spite of go out there and dominantly take out my opponent 
walk away as if I expected to win. Don't overly celebrate. Don't overly bring up nonsense. But go out there and just show them what I'm all about and show them how I get down. That's the best thing I can do. Hmm. And so, okay, so now here we are. What are we, uh, a month and a half away. Do you feel, based on the conversations that you may have had publicly or, or privately, I should say, with the UFC, do you feel like they are hoping that you lose so they don't have to deal with this anymore? Do you feel like the world is against you? Do you feel like the promotion is against you? No, I don't think that the promotion is against me. You know, and I would hate if they ever just wanted somebody to lose. They're, they're in the business of matching up and compelling matchups and fights. Yeah. They shouldn't be in the, um, in, the, in the business of picking who's going to win them. So, no, I don't feel that. Okay. You know, but at the end of the day, I do think that it was important for me to explain. Now, granted, I get, didn't get into specifics and details and exact. He did this to me, and on this fight, this happened, and I didn't get an extra corner pass for this. And then my locker room was like that. I'm not getting into all that. That's petty, and um, it's, it's not going to change anything. The thing is that everyone needs to know that this was not a cry for attention. Mm. I, mean, I do enough things in my life that I'm going to get attention anyway. This was a legitimate, from my personal experiences, things that have happened that People that are involved know exactly what I'm talking about. Okay. That from this day forward, we're going to get those things changed. And I've done, like, Eric, you know, I, I, I take my own propaganda in my own hand. I do my own champ life. I do my own champ camp series. I, you know, I do my own podcast. Mm -hmm. I go out and make my own opportunities. But if, if the person that's promoting me, sorry if I froze, if the person mm -hmm. that's promoting me, if all these networks are talking about picking up my champ camp series and my champ life series and major companies want to endorse it, and get behind it. And they see value. And they see episodes after ep episodes and seasons that we can do this for myself and maybe even other athletes. I'm going to need for my promoter to not be the last one to take notice. Mm. If it was somebody else, like the Mac Life, that thing immediately jumped fire. And it's the same stuff every episode. Flashy cars, <laughs> money, talking crap. Got this, got that. That's all it is. It ain't, he, I ain't seeing him in a boys and girls club. I'm not seeing him giving back to the community and shelters. I'm not seeing him impact. I'm not seeing him network with other other people. This one has substance that can go far. And I brought those things up among several other issues and blatant facts and statistics. And at the end of the conversation, they were like, he's right. Hmm. He's right. And that was the end of the conversation. So um, if, 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 if it goes the way that I plan and, um, you know, we, we really make these changes, then it'd be great. If not, you know, I, I don't expect anything from anybody. It's my career. I'm going to do what I need to do for my career. And I've always done that. And I'm going to continue to do that. So so I said on Thursday, I said at the top of, of, the, of this uh, show and interview that maybe examples would help people understand where you're coming from. But I, I, I take that back now. I think what people wanted to hear and want to hear is if you're being honest with them. If you truly feel this way, yeah. or I, I mean, if they don't feel this now, then I don't know. You know, there's nothing more that you can say. I mean, you could see it in your face. And I'm not going to change their opinion. I'm not going to change their yeah. thought. You know, we were free. Um, everybody got the um, the right to express how they feel. Yeah. I mean, and it's someone out there right now. I don't know how the heck they did it, but it has my same Twitter handle. So if you guys are getting some crazy yes. stuff from this person, it has my same Twitter handle, same um, um, avatar picture, same background picture. Um, they do say in a, uh, in a in a bio that it's a parody or whatever. But who looks at the bio? Someone's out there and, they, and they're making it even worse. Yeah. So people have that freedom to express what they want to express. Well, people need to look for that blue check. That blue check right there next to your yeah. name will tell you if it's verified or not. Um, do you feel Do you feel like you got everything out? Do you feel like you you you? I'm look, I'm look, I'm looking at my uh, notes. It's funny you say that. I'm looking at my notes to make sure I didn't leave nothing. I know I talked a little too much. No, no. Um, but you know, one one of, one of my friends, a kid, a guy named Quid, the one that came in from the restaurant. And um, he said his wife, his wife just came from the Million Woman, war, okay. million woman March. Yep. Um, basically, I realized that it's not about black and white, man. It's about point out things that are not right, things that are unjust, things that are not equal. Um, nobody should be treated any type of way, you know, because of their color, their race, you know, their gender, um, their social economic status. Nobody should be treated. We are human. At the end of the day, I don't walk around thinking that I'm some big deal because I'm the world champion. Society chose that athletes, athletes in our sport, were put on a certain pedestal. I didn't put myself there. 
I don't think my job is any more important than a lawyer, a doctor, a firefighter, a police officer, a school teacher. I think we all have gifts from God. I think we all are put on this earth to do some good. But at the end of the day, society chooses, you know, who they want to make a celebrity. Mm. You know, that's not my choice. Mm. I'm in this sport. I feel like I'm the chosen one because all the stuff I've been through in my life, that's where my nickname comes from. Mm. I feel like God low-key chose me for this, for all the adversity that I had to come through. I had to excessively work for everything I had. And I always felt like I had to work harder than, than the people that were on the other side. I feel like, you know, I've had to, you know, push through. I've had to endure. You know, I've had to wait a lot of times and watch my peers be successful and wait for my chance. You know what I mean? And, and all of that, I never gave up. I mean, you watched this in Strike Force. I could have crawled on, on a rock after Nate Marker knocked my head off. You know what I mean? But I came back strong. Every time I got knocked down, I came back stronger. So I think it's something to be said about that, you know, and, and he sat here and he was talking about their experience at the uh, Million Woman March. And he said, my wife asked me, if you froze time right now and everybody had a chance to reset, right, and come back as somebody different, would you come back as a African-American? If you had a chance to stop right now, freeze and come back to Earth, would you come, would you personally choose to come back as an African American right now. Oh me, you're asking me? You know what I mean, if I had No, no, I'm not asking oh, okay. you yeah. what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. If, if I had if I if I had 20 people in a sure, room, sure, 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 sure. How many sure. people would say I choose to come back as an African American? I hear you. I hear you. You know, no better you know, time. No, better, that's a strong statement. Right, right. Uh, absolutely, no better time than now to talk about this stuff. And I know that people like to use sports and as an escape valve, and they kind of feel uncomfortable or maybe upset. Oh, don't bring these real life issues into our sports. But guess what? Sports involve real people with real lives, with real issues. And uh, and and like I said, I give you a lot of credit for it. It takes a lot of guts. It takes a lot of guts to talk about this stuff because you know, in this day and age, people are very accessible to you, and they could say a lot of things, hurtful things. And um, I commend you. For, for going out and, and telling us about what you've experienced and, and speaking from the heart. So good on you, Tyron Woodley. I appreciate you coming on. I appreciate you clearing the air. I appreciate you talking about this stuff. And, uh, and I hope that you are not deterred by a few messages here or there. I hope that you continue being real and telling us how you really feel. I think a lot of people respect that from you. All right, make sure you guys, UFC 209, March 4th, by the pay-per-view. I will go out there and put a whooping on my man, Wonder Boy, and we will make this statement even stronger. All right. All the best to you, Tyron. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. There he is. Tyron Woodley, the reigning, defending UFC welterweight champion. Uh, like I said, I, I know how people feel when real life blends into sports. I know how it can be. Um, but you got to give the guy a lot of credit for speaking from the heart and not, and not being afraid of backlash or Twitter messages, hateful messages. Um, it's important to talk about these things in particular because only he knows what he's been through. Only he knows how he truly feels. And uh, if there's one thing you could say about the man, at least in my opinion, how I perceive him is that he is very honest, very real, high moral, um, you know, uh, high moral uh, values, ethics, standing good father husband all these things and more so when someone like that is is talking uh you gotta listen you have to listen even if we haven't been through it ourselves it's 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 important to listen